So next, we're going to look a little bit about how to predict the outcomes of crosses. We're going to make this uh, kind of prediction or expectation of what should happen if a cross occurs, and that's something that we'll eventually check against observable results. So when we take our true breeding varieties there, um, say our dominant variety and our, and our recessive trait variety there, um, we've got our uh, pollen and eggs that are going to be only really have a chance to carry the dominant trait. Let me get my thing here. And then we're going to get our pollen and eggs that have that recessive trait and cross them. And that gets us a heterozygote in the F1 generation here, the Philia 1 generation. And if we cross those with each other, okay. Now there's a chance that the pollen and eggs will either have one allele from mom or dad and the, and the other, or the other allele from mom or dad. Okay, so now we have this um, chance possibility here, and then the F2 generation we get possible every combination. Okay, and three of these genotypes will result in the dominant phenotype, the smooth P here, and then our recessive uh, homozygous recessive genotype is going to result in the recessive trait, the wrinkled P. Okay. So the offspring in this F2 generation, there's, um, it's not that all the offspring are always going to segregate in this three to one ratio. There's a chance for every offspring um, when we uh, calculate it. Okay, but if we get enough offspring, say like 100, then we should see around 75%, three quarters of the offspring having this dominant trait and around 25 or a quarter um, having this recessive phenotype. So we're going to see that three to one ratio. Okay, so our Punnett square is one of the ways we're going to predict what the outcome of a cross will be. Okay, so in diploid organisms, the two alleles of the gene separate from one another during gamete formation. Okay, so here's our law of segregation. So uh, from the male parent in our F1 cross there, the male gamete, the sperm, can either have the R, the uh, dominant R allele, or the recessive little r allele. And then in the mom, if we're looking at the F1 generation again, same thing. You can either have, the egg can either carry one allele of the dominant gene uh, allele or of the recessive allele. Okay. So Punnett squares show what's coming from each parent and then filling in the grid to determine what the offspring are. So in the male gametes, there's um, in this column, we're going to fill in with the uh, capital R. In this column, we'll fill in with the little r. And then for the female, this row, we're going to fill in with the capital. And this row, we're going to fill in with the lowercase. And then um, that's going to show what the genotypes are. All right, so we've got our whatever the letters end up being here. And so we end up having one uh, homozygous dominant offspring, one homozygous recessive offspring, and two heterozygous offspring. And this one we're going to switch around to write it as capital then lowercase, right? So that's how we get our one to two to one genotypic ratio. And then from the genotypes, we can figure out what the um, phenotype should be. So in this case, anybody who has a, has a capital R is going to explain, display the dominant trait here, round, and only one offspring is going to show the recessive trait, wrinkled. That's how we get our 3 to 1 uh, phenotype ratio. And notice how we're always writing um, what it is. So it's not 1 to 2 to 1 something. It's 1. Uh, homozygous dominant to two heterozygotes to one homozygous recessive. And down here, it's three round seed to one wrinkled seed. Okay, so I want you to be very clear with how you report your results so there's no way I can um, mistake what it is you've written. So sometimes we're doing a cross to find out what the genotype of the parents was as opposed to really wondering too much about the offspring. Okay, so uh, if we've got this round P and we're not sure what the genotype is, but we know it have, must have one allele of the uh, round allele other, so because it's expressing it, what we can do with plants is we can self-fertilize them. We can cross it back to itself. Okay? And now if we cross it and all the offspring are round, not a single one is wrinkled, then we can be pretty sure that the only gametes it could give to itself would be the, the dominant allele. Okay? And so it, there, therefore the parent must have been homozygous dominant. If uh, we see um, some of the wrinkles coming out in that uh, self-fertilization cross, then we know the parent must have been uh, heterozygous in order for that um, 
recessive allele to possibly um, come out in the res homozygous recessive uh, offspring. Okay, so the other thing we can do, uh, especially because we can't self-fertilize animals, is is if we don't know what the genotype of that dominant P is, we can cross it to something that we know is um, recessive. Okay, so this is a called a test cross. Okay, and then if wrinkled peas appear in the next generation, then we know the parent had to have been uh, heterozygous for the trait. Because if you did this cross and you got all the peas uh, to be round, okay, then it would only it would only look like this top bar. There wouldn't have been say this parent if it's a heterozygous dominant would only be able to give uh, this allele to the offspring. So all of the offspring would be have the dominant trait and be round peas. You would see half of the offspring being wrinkled if this parent was actually heterozygous. Okay. So we have self-fertilization or we can do a test cross in order to find out what the unknown genotype was. Okay. So next we're going to do a little bit of probability. Hopefully this is something you have seen before. Okay, so we're going to start with the product rule. This is what we're mostly going to be using. Okay, so the product rule states that if two or more independent events produce a result, okay, the probability is that all of them will occur is the product of the probability. So if this happens and this happens and this happens all at the same time, okay, then we're going to multiply those chances together. So what is the probability of rolling a six on three dice at once? Okay, what's the probability of three sixes. Well, the probability on each die is one out of a six chance that we're going to roll a six. So we've got one six, one six, one six. And so we multiply that together and what we're going to get, the chance that we roll a six on all three dice at the same time is one out of 216. So when we're going to multiply those, you uh, multiply the denominators and you get the six times six times six is 216. There you go. Okay, so the next probability rule is called the sum rule. The sum rule states if two or more independent events produce the same result, the probability that either will occur is the sum of their probabilities. This is if this or that or that or that, okay? So let's say uh, we've got dice. How many different ways can we roll a seven on a pair of dice? Okay, we've got four plus three, three plus four. There are six different ways to roll a seven. Okay. And each dice has six sides. Okay. So the probability of each combination of just rolling a seven one of these ways is um, six times six, which is one over 36. Right. So now the overall likelihood of obtaining a seven on two dice, okay, because we're going to add each of these probabilities together, is 136 plus 136. Six out of 36 reduces to one out of six. By the way, I'm not going to mark off if you don't reduce because 6 out of 36 is the right answer. It is equal to 1, 6. Reduction is stupid, so don't worry about that. Okay. We're not going to end up using the sum rule very much. Okay. Might, maybe in some of the pedigrees where we're talking about what's the probability that um, this or this happens, most of the time we're going to be using the product rule, which is where we're multiplying our probabilities together. You'll see that in a second. Okay. So here's our Punnett square uh, method of determining the uh, outcome of the offspring. Uh, I prefer, and it's, I think it's a lot cleaner and easier to use the fork line method. In the fork line method, basically, you have columns. Uh, so here we've got what are the chances of the female gamete uh, giving the offspring uh, one of the two uh, alleles. And then the next column is what are the chances of the male gamete giving the offspring one of the two alleles. And so we start off with, say, here's the female. Okay, it's a half and a half. And then for each of those, we're going to have, there's this chance of what the male gamete is doing over here. And then we apply the product rule across. So one half times one half here is one quarter. And that's whether or not we get two of the dominant alleles. We've got down here our homozygous recessive because we have the two R's. We've got one quarter chance there. And then for the heterozygotes, um, we've got uh, one heterozygote chance here is a quarter, one here is a quarter. These are the same, so we're going to plop them together. One quarter plus one quarter equals one half. This is where we're using the sum rule, okay? This is where we're using the product rule. What are the chances of this and 
this and this happening and together. And then here we're saying, what are the chances of, of either this particular combination or this particular combination happening? And then we're adding those together to have the summation of one half. And look, we're getting our one to two to one genotype ratio here. Okay. This is especially useful for when we've got uh, multiple genes or we've got different chances that are a little more tricky to um, uh, kind of figure out with a typical Punnett square. Okay, so the main rule that we're using when we do the um, fork line diagram again is the product rule. So that's the probability that the various things are all going to happen. So whether the penny flips on its head and the dime flits on its head and the quarter lands on its head. Okay, head, head, head. And then we um, multiply those together to get us the probability of all three happening at once. So when we do the branch, we calculate along the branch to get our probability of the final outcome. And so this is just a um, whether or not something is heads or tails. So just like the Punnett square, the fork line method is helping us calculate the chances of any particular set of coin flips of this and this and this all happening at the same time. Now these ratios in our example here are 50% heads or tails, but they don't have to be 50-50. It could be a three to one chance. There could be more than two options if we have multiple alleles. So this can get um, pretty complicated, but overall, um, it's a lot easier to use than the Punnett square. So anything that's bigger than just like a, a two by two option on a Punnett square, you'll want to probably do with the fourth line method. And we'll do go over that in recitation a lot too. Okay, so um, one other thing that we're really looking at when we're doing these um, counts, we're sort of, uh, um, when we calculate what we expect to have happen, we're going to compare that to actual numbers of offspring, actual you know stuff that's being um, that we're measuring, and so it matters how what our sample size is because if we've got um, just you know uh, we're going to do this cross, we're going to count five offspring, it's actually not a huge unreasonable chance that we all five of them are uh, smooth. Uh, instead of we're expecting to see only three quarters, but it could be all of them. That could just randomly happen. The chance that that happens is about 3%. The bigger we get here, if we have 10 offspring, what are the chances all of them around gets to 0.1%. That's even more unlikely. And if we look at 50 offspring, it's extremely unlikely that um, we would never see a, a, a wrinkled pea popping up in that generation. Okay. So we're going to be testing statistical significance and we're going to want to have as big a population to test as possible in order to be sure of what's actually going on. Okay. So the more as offspring we get, the odds of seeing only the um, uh, dominant trait here when we were expecting about a quarter of the offspring to be recessive is just going to get lower and lower and lower. And we can say with more and more certainty that something has happened or gone wrong something in this case the most likely thing would be this actually is not heterozygote okay this parent is actually uh, homozygous dominant and is always contributing a dominant allele of the offspring and that's probably what's going on but we can't quite say that with certainty if we've only got five offspring but we can certainly make that uh, claim there if we've got 50 and we're never seeing that happen so that'll be an important piece when we start getting chi squares and so here's uh, the product rule in action and how we're um, another another thing here is sometimes it's easier to calculate the opposite of what you're looking for and then just do a quick subtraction. So in this case, what is the probability that at least one of these coins will not be a head? So the probability that one of these will be a tail. Okay. So in that case, we could go, all right, well, the only option here is, is if we have three heads. That's the only way there's not going to be at least one tail. So we could, that's easy. It's a half, a half, a half. Okay. So the probability is one eighth. And so the probability of not getting that combination is one minus one eighth. So seven eighths. So instead of having to do the whole product rule for this entire thing, you can sort of think quick, um, think smart, work less, right? And um, solve for the opposite of what you're looking for and then subtract that from one, okay? Because the combination of all the probabilities should equal one. All right. So that uh, can certainly save you some time if what you're looking for is a very specific thing. Um, 
in your, or what you're looking for is very broad, but it'd be easier to calculate the probability of that one specific thing happening. Okay. So this is where forked line is going to get really useful when we start having multiple uh, traits that we're looking at at the same time. Okay. So in this case, we've got the parental generation. We're crossing uh, some true breeding homozygous dominant with some true breeding homozygous recessive lines for both the seed color and the seed shape. And then we get our, off, our F1 offspring here where we have hybrids. Everybody's a, um, a heterozygote. Okay. And then when we cross those, we can look at phenotypes instead of genotypes if we want. So um, if, if they get a dominant uh, allele here, they're going to be yellow. If they get a recessive allele, they get um, green. And then we can look at the wrinkling, whether or not they're round or smooth. And that's three quarters to one quarter ratio as well in both instances. And then so we follow this along. The probability of being yellow and round is three quarters times three quarters. So we get nine sixteenths. Three quarters yellow, quarter wrinkled. That gives us three sixteenths yellow and wrinkled. Our green and round here, we're going to multiply those and get our 3 sixteenths for that phenotype combination. And then here we've got green and wrinkled. One quarter times one quarter is 1 16th, both having, having both recessive traits. Okay? So this is going to be a very useful tool when we start getting into more complicated crosses.